Hello, friends. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. My name is Cherie Burton, and I am the host of this show. Coming up on almost four years now, this is episode 194. Just did the math and figured out that the very last episode of this year, December 28th, is my 200th episode. Woohoo! And a fun reveal is forthcoming for that. Uh, so be watchful. I hope you are following us on Instagram, Cherie.Burton, as well as asking to join our private Facebook group, Women Seeking Wholeness. Announcements will be made with a new name change, so it will not be called Women Seeking Wholeness in 2023. So excited. And and for those of you who may have missed the memo, the reason I'm changing the name Women Seeking Wholeness is because uh, after all of this time and space in my own journey and interviewing so many amazing guests and kind of deep diving into my own descent journey, my death and rebirth process, it's just become apparent to me that there's no reason to seek wholeness because it's already part of our nature. We just need to embrace it. So becoming aware of that has been huge for me. Today I've got Dana Swain. She's a PhD Jungian depth psychologist, a personal and spiritual coach, and expressive arts therapist. She's also a Kundalini meditation teacher with Heart of Consciousness and the author of When the Light Breaks Through, Understanding Kundalini Experiences Through Psychology, Body, and Story. Now I have her book and it's been a great dive for me to just understand how this works physiologically, not just spiritually, but how this is a physiological state change that can ensue when you go into this depth work and you really surrender and start to have levels of awakening. So uh, she'll talk us through that, what it is, you know, what her experience with Kundalini was, what might initiate a Kundalini process. It's quite complex and intriguing and very feminine. So I learned a whole lot interviewing her on this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Dana, I'm so happy to have you on this episode. I love this book. As, As little as I've read the beginning and the end, I bookended it. (laughs) That's perfect. because I want to get to the highlight and I know that you'd recommend it I start with a preface and end with your story so so thank you for let helping me to see kundalini in a way I've never seen it before oh thank you so much for having me here and fellow Jungian nerd (laughs) (laughs) that's right right yes definitely so let's start just diving into what is kundalini how would you define that Yeah, the kundalini is the kind of the spiritual energy that exists in everyone, male and female. Uh, Usually it's in a dormant state Um, and then something happens and uh, it brings it up. So it's 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 the energy of consciousness, but not not our rational consciousness. So sort of that divine conscious energy. It's the power of creativity, um, Mm. presence. Um, it's more on, the, it's like cosmic. It's like, uh, the equivalent on a macrocosmic level is what the in Indian traditions, they call Shakti. So that kind of divine feminine macrocosmic energy actually exists in us as well as Kundalini. So as the Kundalini comes up, the Shakti comes down. Mm. And so you've referenced this as more of a feminine energy in your work, which I found really fascinating because I, I always thought Shakti was feminine as well. It is. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so you're talking about this cosmic universal force of kind of like all that is. Yes. All it's very station. Yes. Divine. Yeah. And it, and we are each born with it. It comes in a, it's it's not activated yet. Right. But would would you say that it does reside at the base of the spine in the root chakra area? Or does it kind of is it kind of all over the body? Right. Right. You can think of even as a subtle body as an emanation of kundalini. So in that way, that's called prana kundalini. So, you know, it's called prana or chi or or prana kundalini, which is kind of that subtle body enlivening vitality of force that you know, just makes the body run. Um, so in that way, it's kind of all over. Um, the very subtle part of Kundalini that's got that sort of more spiritual presence, consciousness aspect of it. Traditionally, in tantric Hindu tradition, where it, where it's mostly Kundalini is mostly talked about, um, they do say it resides at the base of the spine. But in our 
practical experience of it that may not be as it awakens it may not be exactly how we you know think of it or picture it so you know like traditionally it's at the base of the spine it's coiled through times and then as it awakens it goes up the central channel Mm -hmm. often associated with the spinal channel but you just think of it as the middle channel and goes up the chakras the chakras open and you know it rises to the top of the head where there's an experience of unity with shakti shiva also consciousness and manifestation um but it's not quite that linear and cut and dry so you know when you experience it you might first experience it in your heart you might experience it in your belly area you might experience it in your feet so it really is uh kind of an individual experience how that comes up and it doesn't always like go up like a ladder of the chakras it goes more like a i always want to say i forget the name of it like like ginseng works on whatever needs to be healed in one's body right so it's almost like uh say it could be like a sacred geometric pattern if it needed to to address certain certain places in the body that hold tension Tension or yeah patterns yeah cool all right so i loved one of the definitions you have in your book that i um just underlined here i'm just gonna read it in your preface you said kundalini is the light that explodes into insight beyond the threshold of limited self-identification into the vast consciousness of everything. And I do mean everything. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just going to repeat that. So it's the light that explodes into insight. So that's just power, right? Just like there's action to it. It's embodied. Absolutely embodied. Which I think we've been taught, and especially if you're on an academic path or even a religious path, like, I was always told that the spirit or God's spirit or the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is like a warm feeling in the heart and it's peaceful. And, and that's, you know, that is what it is. It's there's, that's a beautiful, peaceful, comforting feeling. I think what we haven't been taught are these power surges or these um, jolts really is how I've often experienced some of these sensations as opposed to just warm and loving and, so do you want to expound on that just a little bit? Because just yeah. that phrase, the light that explodes into insight beyond this threshold of limited self-identification. Yeah, and I think you've talked about this in, in some of your past, your podcasts and your experience. In, in, I mean, grace in, in the Christian tradition is very much that energy of Kundalini. So it can be warm and loving and, you know, happy, happy. But... Kundalini's purpose is to wake us up to who we really are, which is beyond individuated personality consciousness, even psyche consciousness, right? Just our personal psyches. It's a much more collective cosmic. And so she's going to go. And sometimes that means she's really going to power through, open up whatever things or resistances, patterns, tensions are keeping that closed. Um, and she'll move with force. And when those things open up, though, when those tensions and patterns start dissolving or kind of moving way out of the way, that's when insight happens because it's touching on that more divine consciousness. And then your perspective changes. And because it's a direct experience, it changes permanently. It's not like you have an intellectual thought that can then, yeah, no, that sounds like a good philosophy. Yeah, I align with that. I believe that. This is, I know that. You know, Jung yeah. said, I don't believe I know. And I'm sure he, in my opinion, experienced this kind of uh, kundalini awakening when he had his uh, confrontation with the unconscious, right? I think mm-hmm. when you look at the Red Book and you see the mandalas and the fire and in my yes. opinion, he was having that kind That's of so interesting. I have a red book over here. It's just like, whoa, if I want to dive deep and go into like, yeah. So other Jungian nerds would know that that's the red book is, is Carl Jung. Um, yeah. His, <laughs> right. again, yes. Like his awakening, his expansion into a collective conscious. Um, so with this uh, knowledge of, this purpose of the kundalini energy trying to wake you up it's like your grandma shaking you or something it's very feminine yeah right <laughs> um, and uh and i just i'm just going to share one little thing and then i want to get really into your story because you've had some fascinating encounters you've had some fascinating dreams 
as far as what we're talking about now with this embodiment thing, uh, I, and I've done a whole podcast episode on this, but it's been about a year and a half now. So in February of 2021, I, well, I was supposed to do it in 2020, but they called off travel for COVID. I was supposed to go to Costa Rica and, and participate with almost a hundred other people in a, a very safe, secure medical facility to do the ayahuasca medicine, which is a very feminine plant medicine. I'm sure you're aware of it. And it would have never been something that I would have ever thought of doing. Um, it just kept calling to me. And then, like I said, I was going to go and then COVID happened. So another year later, I find myself in this, in this place four nights in a row. And on the fourth night of taking this medicine and I'd had some reticence with it. And I'm like, I don't know if I should trust this, but something in my soul was just like, just be with it and just stay with it. And I was doing a lot of deprogramming and a lot of deconditioning and unpacking psychically, ancestrally. Mm -hmm. So the fourth night, third dose, I wasn't feeling anything. And I was just like, okay. So I went out under the stars and I just gave gratitude and I went back in. And all I can tell you is I absolutely came undone. So I don't remember this, but I was the one person in a group of 50. There's always one. Um, and I'm normally very reserved and very private. And I usually do my wrestling in my private chambers that I can, I, from what my friends who were there witnessed, they thought that I was, um, having a, a snap, like I snapped. So my whole body was jerking. And I just, the only thing I remember is this, it was just those of you watching on YouTube will see what I'm doing, but I was literally going up. Like I was, um, like I stuck my finger in a light socket and I was just going up and up and up and I was shaking. And my friend said that I was failing. I kicked one of the shamans in the face. They had to have each, this is not in the episode, by the way, this is the episode <laughs> too, that I'm just now sharing because I was a little bit of ashamed of what happened, but all the shamans that had gathered around me said, you're getting a reboot. This is when this happens, you're so, you, and they didn't mention Kundalini by name, but that's what came to me is this is a Kundalini type of um, psychic opening or awakening for you to just basically unplug from the matrix, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, is I wasn't afraid this entire time. Yeah. Um, I was very disoriented, but I had flashes and images come through and symbols that I was always attracted to. Um, I even, you know, there's, there was even like a statue of Christ on the, on the grounds and that, and that came through for me. Like there were just a lot of, you know, pivotal symbols and, and things that had come through during that. And I was like, this feels so chaotic, but yet I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm still integrating that experience. And it was like a death simulation to me. And it was like an ego death. And we can talk about that too but because it was so embodied um and because it was so dramatic mm -hmm. um i went offline for a little bit <laughs> mm -hmm. and when i came back i was of course very exhausted and um i felt like i had just run a marathon mm -hmm. and it wasn't very long maybe three hours two three hours well that is kind of long i guess but it, as as ceremonies go it was it was a few hours but um I can tell you that like I've had another experience, similar experience, but it was much more gentle when I was on a sacred Mary Magdalene pilgrimage in France by myself in my bed. But this was like for the, everyone to see and for, and, and that was part of the own, I think this is, I needed a physical energetic reboot mm -hmm. to, to just really like, take me out for a little bit and bring me back online. Yeah. So I've heard of similar things happening to people and, and, and I just want to make a disclaimer. Like I'm not advocating that people go to, you know, do a medicine like this and in, in another country. I mean, it was very safe conditions and it was, you know, I did a plant diet and all kinds of things to prepare spiritually and physically that said, and even though I had such a pronounced experience, um, I've had a lot of people approach me and say, Oh, I want to do what you did. And I'm like, I don't know that you do like, unless this is calling you and maybe it is. And that's why we're connecting. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people need to do plant medicine ceremonies in order to have a Kundalini experience or to awaken. Mm -hmm. But in my case, it was so deep what I was trying to unplug from mm -hmm. that. I almost needed something that, like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm, I just want to say when you, when you use the phrasing, 
light that explodes into insight beyond the threshold of limited self-identification, I had a certain identity. Yeah. And I had a certain way I saw myself based on my roles and my programming. And it's almost like my soul, God, the universe, whatever, want to just be like, oh, that's not all you are. Right. And let's get past that. So yeah, it's something yeah. not pronounced kind of wake me yeah. up. You know, it's interesting because um, it sounds like you had Kriya. So that the that thing, that motion that you just made was a very Kriya Kundalini coming up. Oh. So often when the Kundalini comes up and it's hitting blocks, because our bandwidth essentially isn't yet big enough, the channel in us isn't open enough to just let it flow like mm. without hindrance. So those are Kriyas. Then they, they, how do you they, spell that? K R I Y A S. Okay. This is used in different terminology, different ways and different traditions. But in my tradition, then it's it's just the movement as Kundalini is ascending and, and hitting blockages. Then you'll have these kind of jerky experiences. Sometimes they're very blissful, but it's still the energy. It was. It did that, have that element, a blissful yes, element. Yeah. 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 Should, yeah. And the other thing I, I noticed in what you said, which is interesting, is that it, one time it happened to you at night while you're in bed. Mm -hmm. And Kundalini so often, we call it, we have a joke in our practice called it, we call it um, Kundaliniitis because you're in bed and all of a sudden you are awake. And that, it, I think the reason of, for that is, if you can, Kundalini has, you know, reasons, but I, I think it's when our conscious mind and our ego is a little bit more relaxed and out of the way, like perhaps you're about to go into dream state or we're just not, in our roles and responsibility, our mind is relaxed and she is able to make a lot of things happen. And she, that's a great time for her to work. So, mm. yeah. And I, and I think for those people who are listening, who are like, uh, no, thanks. You know, if I, do I have to have that kind of thing to awaken? Do I have to have jolts or whatever? And, and I almost want to say yes. Like, would you agree with me? Like, it is an embodied thing. Like, if we're talking about fully awakening, mm -hmm. uh, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think people who wake up out of any tradition, in any tradition, including the Christian tradition, they will have this Shakti happening. They just won't call, they'll call it something else. Grace is a great way. Um, to speak of it. Yeah. I love that you put that together with grace. Love yeah, it. for sure. For sure. And those, and kind of the Sophia aspect of that mm -hmm. grace. Um, and I, you know, I mentioned in a lot of cultures, this is, this is a known and shamanic cultures this is a known quantity entity of, of energy going through. So if you're very open, I don't think you have to necessarily have all the jolting. I mean, I think people don't necessarily, but if it's, must have just had a <laughs> I mean, but, it just, but if it's new and it's really kind of a specifically more Kundalini energy popping, then yeah, it, it usually something like that will happen. And it doesn't, it can be much softer for a lot of people. It's very soft. Um, it just depends on a particular person's, awakening process but well, and i don't do anything lightly either right? it's just my personality right like, i don't just dip my toe and i usually like dive in well when you do ayahuasca or something like that which i i i have a, a lot of respect for particularly when it's done you know with a lot of facilitation and safely right but i think it's happening a lot now people kind of going and having and then they're not and having an experience then kundalini because their ego is out of the way their rational consciousness is out mm -hmm. kundalini happens but people aren't always and it could be lsd too or something like that there's a lot of experimentation with that and i'm always feeling a little cautionary about that because people then have a kundalini awakening and depending on how much they were doing or what what their um psychological readiness is for it um the kundalini might keep going it doesn't just happen in that one mm -hmm. instance and then they have to really come to terms with that psychologically and start integrating it and if they're not ready for that yeah uh, then it, the, the resistance and fear around that awakening can cause unpleasant experiences yeah for some people it can launch them into psychosis 
You know, yes. And I, I think that that's potential. I kind of address that in my book. I think that that has gotten a lot of more hype than the good openings, you know, like the, the more sure. graceful openings. Um, so I think there's potential for that, but I, but I only if the person is mentally not stable. But it is important in a Kundalini thing to process, I think, to find somebody who either has experienced it or a teacher who can manage it because it can be a little disconcerting to have that going on, particularly in our Western culture. There is no there's no container for this in our culture. And so then not only. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people when I talked to, I'm so surprised they were like, oh, I think I had that. But then I thought I was going crazy. So there's a way that people actually clamp down on it too and it doesn't happen and it's not worked with because of the fear of going crazy and then how our culture doesn't hold that at all yeah absolutely and and i i think because we are normalizing some of these things that were considered super woo and we're like coming back to you know you know i just keep using the word embodied because it's all been so cerebral in the past right. it's all been over analysis you know the over analysis and the explanation and the trying to contextualize something that cannot be a force that cannot be contained. <laughs> right. Um, right. It's just, yeah, we're moving out of that. So I want us to dive into your story because it's really fascinating. It started, um, at least in, in your book, you talk about it being at the age of 23. Do you want to kind of walk us through what happened and kind of how it puts you on the path that you're on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I will say that I think I had a very early spiritual orientation. I had a kind of a, a major experience when I was eight of just this divine presence that lasted for a few hours. Um, so I, I was already sort of oriented to spirituality. But the thing when the Kundalini happened is that I had been physically assaulted and I, I had just ended a long-term relationship, moved to San Francisco, started graduate school. So a lot of turmoil and change and pressure in my life. And then when the physical assault happened, I just, I kind of was really trying to get over it, move on, you know, do my life. And at some point it just didn't happen and was not happening. And so there was this real ego death where every sense of myself, every um, mental crutch I had that was told me who I was sort of or like a little unconscious. Oh, this is who you are. And this is who you are. And you're Dana. And it's like this. They just, I couldn't hang on. It just, I just fell down. Really. I, I described it as falling down a well. And I was just kind of laying on my bed and I just thought not, it was just completely silent. There was nothing. It was really like, just fell down a well. I'm at the bottom. There is no more bottom. I'm at it. And then this energy just started kind of coming in. And, and in this case, it was very soft, but it was this, this feminine presence felt like it was all around me and very comforting and loving. Um, and then it just kept on. So, it, and then it kind of, you know, eased out. But then days later, I would just have these rushes of fire through my system and like my arms and my legs. Um, this rush of love all, and, you know, seeing things like looking at people and seeing golden light come out of their face when they smiled. And just, I, and I wasn't afraid because the presence that came along with that was so um, beautiful and loving. I just felt like it was really sacred presence. It was presence with a capital P. Mm -hmm. So I was willing to, be there with that because I, there was no fear for me associated with that. And then it led to, I was going to the California Institute of Integral Studies at the time. And I met my first teacher, Dr. Ola Luchkova, and she was talking about Christian mysticism and um, Tantra or Hinduism. And I just was, she blew me away when she was talking about energy and grace and how it descends. And, mm. and I was like, Whoa, that's my experience. So then I, you know, and it was by grace or synchronicity that I met her um, because I still wasn't clear what was happening for me. And then I, I worked with her for a number of years. And um, so that kind of stabilized me and, and gave me context where I didn't have context. Is that, is that sort of just you coming into solidifying meditation in in a way that's not many people do not many people work with a teacher that long meditating sometimes how many three or four times a day i think you said or something like that 
um, that's uncommon. It's yeah. uncommon. And I think you're, you're called to that, right? You're, it, it, right. it's an intensive path, um, that most of us don't undertake. Yeah. Um, and that put you in a different space in your body, right. To be able to, to do the work that would come later. Right. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, she, she really, um, Olga really had me work even with nature and feeling like your chakra system and how it relates to power spots in nature, which was a very different thing that I've never done. I did Vipassana, I did Dzogchen. Um, I did a lot of sitting and retreats and then, you know, now I sit twice a day, you know, I don't sit as much as I did then. I don't feel like it's more, more conscious. So it's more of a regular experience that just is happening. And so, but to deepen that, I still, of course, do, do meditation. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I'm not nearly as practiced as you and, or as, you know, consistent, Yet I find too that my my soul and God are just saying like tree or life is the practice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's just it it kind of is kind of turned over for me. Just yeah. like flowing with that life as a prayer, or life as a meditation, and letting that grace yeah come in. Because um, I love the Eastern and Western way of looking at that energy. Right, right. Yeah, I do too, which is why I wrote this book that's kind of Jungian, but also because yeah. that's my, I love like it comes, Shakti comes through dreams, you know, or Kundalini comes through dreams and so, and synchronicities. And so when we, that is flow as much as this vertical flow upwards, that engagement with life, you know, on the horizontal level is, is as important. That's the integration point, And that's how we, affect change in our world so like what you're doing here is amazing because it's reaching a lot of people from your experience your curiosity you know that is it's crucial thank you so after you you know worked with olga for seven years or whatever you you said it was then you found your your what you call kind of like your spiritual lineage yeah so really ta uh kundalini is based in kind of tantra and she used to um olga would often quote things from tantric shaivism Kashmir shaivism and i was like what is that what is that i was i it always really resonated with me and so finally she handed me a book and she's like here <laughs> you just read this so I, I read this book it was called dynamic stillness and then several years later um and i, I loved it i ate it up i, I kept it and then i um I, I had a second big awakening when I got out of a long-term relationship that was, it was fine, but it was kind of just not allowing me to grow in the way I think that I needed to grow. And then I had a really strong uh, awakening and um, at least this time I knew what it was. So that was helpful. So again, I wasn't afraid, but it was quite intense. And in that one, I'll say that I did see the important things that I came away with were um that when we die, all we do is take off our bodies, like a coat, kind of like we have this personality and body that we put on to make our way through the world. And then when we die, that just goes away, but consciousness is still there. Um, and that the earth was going through a massive evolutionary change, that kind of Gaia consciousness, if you want to put it that way, of which we're a part. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like giving birth. So it was like, it's touch and go. It still is like this evolution of consciousness can happen, but not without everybody making an effort. And that there was a sense of like all these people coming to midwife this evolution. I'm about souls that have incarnated right yeah. now. Yeah. So that was my vision. And, uh, mm. you know, I won, but there's a, I wasn't, there's a ton of people, souls coming to kind of midwife this evolution of uh, consciousness, which really Kundalini is, uh, Gobi Krishna used to call it um, the evolutionary energy in man. So in my happy place, I imagine that really at some point we will all be born with Kundalini just open. It's already open. It's open because that's part of our evolutionary that's process. so fascinating you can see i've got christ over here and buddha over here <laughs> you know exactly perfect and um i love just this idea of the you know the lotus the opening of the lotus and and, and that's you know more the eastern tradition and then the rose in the western tradition of the divine right. feminine right and so i remember reading that in your book and you had a series of dreams 
I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead. No, that's fine. Go story. For it. Um, but you know, you found higher teachers, you, you know, you found this lineage, you found these traditions that really resonated with you. And I think you used the word curiosity with me. Um, my curiosity has driven this entire thing. Like, um, I will feel a spark. I'll get curious about something, feel the spark and follow it. Beautiful. Yeah. And it was like that with, I call, you know, I'm not the only one that I didn't coin this phrase, but the red thread. Mm -hmm. I've heard of that. Yes. Yeah. Right. And it's like, if you want to go down a big old rabbit hole, keep following the red thread. And it's, it's taken me all over, but but what what I what I love is that the unconscious works through symbols, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so if we're aware, sometimes it's numbers like eleven eleven or whatever. Right, you know. right. Um, but there were there's just some sacred symbols that have shown up for me consistently, and um, once I activated the part of my brain and noticed it, I started to see it more and more, and it was very affirming. Yeah. Um. But but I and I've had really interesting dreams throughout my life. They've kind of dried up a little bit. So when I read all your dreams and how they came to you, I'm like, okay, I would love to be, now that I feel like I've got my big girl pants on and I've got through the worst <laughs> of the awakening, I'm, I'm ready to receive more. I'm ready to be shown more. And I know that that is a deep inner process and that there's all kinds of ways to have dreams come through and we're not in control of it, et cetera. Uh, I, I looked at your dreams as very sacred and I don't know how much you want to share them. Obviously you have it in a book. So, um, how, my, my first question before we get to kind of the content of your dreams is how do you do that? I know that there are people that have degrees in dream analysis and um, the dreamscape and the imaginal realm, but that how do you put yourself in a place of openness as a practice, I guess, to, to receive through, if it's your desire to receive sort of more through dreams and to, to be, I guess, guided or taught through dreams. Right. Right. Mine, I, they just happen. That being said, I think that, um, like Steve Eisenstadt uh, talks about this, he's a big dream guy at Pacifica Graduate Institute yeah. and ending, right? But just asking, just having, so your intention of wanting to have more dreams and then going to sleep and right before you go to sleep, say, I'd really, you know, I, I'd like a dream, I'd like a dream. And, and if you put that intention out there enough, they'll start coming. And then the trick to remembering them is to not wake up too fast. So often they have, you know, in the REM cycle, there's one right before you kind of wake up full on. And if you can just stay and um, not wake up too fast and get to your day, just kind of be present with hmm, what just came up there. And it helps to set an intention by having a like a pen and paper by your desk. So all these things that we can set up consciously then kind of gives the unconscious signal. Yeah. It's like, I'm ready. I'm ready to take notes. Yes. Right. Okay. And when you start taking notes, it's like the unconscious is like, she's listening. And then it will start coming more and more and more because you're sort of, you're working a muscle, you're opening a portal. Mm -hmm. And then when you write it down and you're conscious of it, then that portal stays open and gets wider. And, you know, the dreaming will happen more. And Steve Eisenstadt says also have um, pepperoni. I don't know if that actually works. <laughs> <laughs> Of all, things. of all things. Okay. Well, walk us through, and I'm going to direct people to your book for sure. So they can kind of read, but if there was one dream that you had that, and it, cause all of this is about your awakening to the goddess and that you were not really focused on that. And then you, you recognized that cause you wanted to have more of a, uh, I guess, less anthropomorphic, more, more of a, a balanced view of the soul, whatever you can put it in your own words, but that was my take. Right. It's like, okay, I don't want to get it locked into gender here. So that you had kind of, kind of overlooked the goddess or yes. that. So if there was one dream that kind of really sticks with you in terms of what she is and how she came through for you, what would that be? Yeah. I think the one that really impacts me was when I dreamt of the rose in the garden. And then um, she was like, the divine feminine was, I was in a garden looking around and then I was sort of being called to this one rose and she was like the mother of the God of the garden. And she was, she was, um, so I kind of came to pick her up 
And I was actually getting scolded, like, you need to take care of your own garden, like know what's in here and take care of it or it's going to die. And I was like, so I just went to like smell to, and the root was so shallow that I picked her up and it, it, she got unearthed from the ground and then she turned to ash in my hands. She just burned up ash. And I was in my dream. I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. So I worked with that dream a lot in, in movements and in drawing and in journaling. And there's a little poem, I think at the end in, of yeah, that beautiful. process. And I can read it too. When, when you get, when you're ready for me to read it. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good poem. I just said it was a poem. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the sadness was like that root. Like it went so deep mm. in me. Um, I think, and that was clear that if I wasn't going to tend attend to the divine feminine in myself, then this, you know, like the soul of my, the garden of my soul was going to die. And I think that actually that had a bigger implication for how we do or do not attend to the divine feminine in our world and in our culture and the disaster that mm -hmm. um, ensues if we don't. So it was kind of like a call to get my shit together, frankly. And yeah. I listened. And yeah. just more integrating the, the sacred feminine and the masculine and and not to and deny those her. power structures that we see. You and I were talking about this before we hit record, but just the power structures we see. Some of your dreams were um, sort of a, a a symbolic view of you know the masculine's head being cut off by the you know the powerful goddess, and she's so loving and she's doing it so lovingly that it's like, no, we have to get out of our heads. We have to. We've been doing this this rote way and this power over and in this unconscious way. So it's just like this whole rebirth of, of her energy. Um, it's okay if I read the poem. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the lineage, right? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Um, something must die for something else to be born. Take up the mantle of voice. Speak for the darkness, for memory, for the value of grief, for the power inherent in silence, in the cloak still unshed. Speak to me of me so that I may be soothed in my long sleep. Wake me so I can roar. So you had put in your journal entry, just as a side note after this, that it is the goddess who has sacrificed herself. It is the mother dying so her voice can be carried through to the next lineage holders. And that's probably the souls that you're talking about that have come down to kind of midwife this rebirth. She's asking me to be a voice to know my own garden and soul so that it thrives in feminine wisdom to hold the darkness, the other world, the ancestors to see in the dark and bring the darkness back to soothe the light with soul with the cooling hand of the mother. So beautiful. Thank you. Well, um, I want to kind of, bring this back now to what we can do practically to sort of manage this energy and to not be in fear of it really. Yeah. There's a lot of programming about fear and fear around, you know, the unseen realms and what's happening within and what's in me. And I'm, and a lot of us are afraid of our own love and power. And so mm -hmm. these inherent energies can kind of freak us out. So can you just give us a couple ways practically to kind of manage that and to reduce the fear around it sort of emerging? Yeah. Well, if it is emerging, and, and it may be for many people listening to this podcast, I think um, softening around it is so important. You know, it's really a surrendering. And it's not like surrender is kind of gets a loaded word, right? Because it's like, oh, surrender, I'm giving up. But it's more like a softening and an easing into and an allowing of uh, this energy to kind of move through you. So you're not losing you, you're gaining you through this experience. You've become more yourself. This is an intimate, um, divine you that's just waking up. So while it can seem a little um, uh, disconcerting at times, if you open and soften around it, then it actually gives you so many gifts. And I do think, I do think um, all the practical things about taking care of your body, getting enough sleep, unless you're not, because Kunoi means coming up and get a nap. Um, <laughs> treating your body very well. I think being in nature is such a um, helpful grounding kind of thing to be in this process with. I think meditation is pretty crucial. 
um, even if it's just like five or 10 minutes, just so that you are in contact with that. And as it's going up, can also go out. So this energy is a relational, loving energy as well. So, mm-hmm. and it flows, it transmits, other people pick it up. So who knows, maybe you'll pick up a little bit after this, um, you know, you'll go to bed tonight and have some amazing dreams. Who knows? Get a dream journal. I'm going to put it by my bed and it's be like, okay, here I go. Yeah. Kundalini is catching, I, I like mm-hmm. to say. So that, that energy of love, that resonance of love is something that, can affect people just by being in the same room as you. And this is what we need in the world right now, right? We need this kind of catching fire of this, this love. So it it's, um, shouldn't be feared, but it certainly needs to be paid attention to. And if necessary, then find somebody who's had the experience or a teacher um, and doing meditation rather. So there's Kundalini yoga, which I, I'm totally fine with. Except I think if you're already in a kundalini process, it can really put too much fuel on the fire. So, oh. so it's okay, you know, and it depends on the person. Absolutely. You know, like some people that might be great and they want it more and it's really helping. But if, if someone feels like their kundalini process is really happening quite strongly, then opening and softening and allowing and doing some just soft breath work, just in, out, in, out is probably better than a lot of heavy breathing and um, gestures just because it's, you know, not meant to be an explosive. Sometimes it is explosive. There's no reason to make it more explosive because you still want to be able to integrate it. It's kind of like let nature take its course, but support your body while your body does what don't force it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's certainly helpful to have a group of people who know that experience or can support you when things get a little wonky because you know we just talked about so many people think that they're going crazy it's really really helpful to have a group of people who support you and they're not you know they say that you're right on it's absolutely fine it's totally normal anyway and- congratulations that's kind of what happened to me with the, i literally had that group of shamans around me and all of them were like well congratulations like yeah and how great was that what a container for you right yeah and i i would have never gotten that in i had to leave this country i believe i had to leave my community of origin and my everything that was familiar and everything and to get that kind of a congratulatory like welcome to the other side you know you're waking up yeah and this is my this is like my my purpose in life is to let people wake up and have a container for them. I mean, I want this to catch fire in the sense of, I want us to know that Kundalini is happening and this is normal or any kind of awakening, spiritual awakening is, and it's probably happening more now because there's so much trauma. So oftentimes trauma is one of the major things that people have this awakening. And I want people to know that they're okay. It's fine. It's good. But to have, you know, people be able to help and support with that. And the more that we add ourselves for having these experiences, um, the more people feel safe and out in themselves around them. So I love just this idea of it being an infusion of grace. So for those of you listening who are more from the Christian tradition and you want it to kind of fit within your your the beliefs you hold and it feels like it might be a Satan or evil or whatever, just know that Christ did teach the kingdom of God is within. And there's a lot of stuff about Jesus being a wisdom teacher and all these things and having his own Kundalini experiences. But um, for me, I had to, I have to kind of look at it that way as a force that um, is benevolent. And yeah, the grace word just really speaks to me. Yeah, you know, I think the first dream that I had that kicked off all the the stuff in my dissertation was about um, Kundalini and Jacob uh, Jacob Berm. I think I'm saying. I hope I'm saying is he was a Christian mystic philosopher in I think the 15th century, and so he's right. And I thought that's fascinating. I didn't even know who he was, and his name came up in my dream. And then I looked him up, and he was a Christian mystic. That's so interesting. And when you see what he writes, it's all these seven different worlds and fire and light. And, and so it's a very Christian, I think, experience of uh, waking up uh, and, and he's having the experience of Kundalini. It's sort of, he calls it, I think, the feminine face of God um, mm. this is the principle. So it's really, it is in the Christian tradition. It's just got different names to it. Sure. sure. And, and Mary Magdalene is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Dana, this has been fascinating and I would really encourage everyone to get your book. It's called When the Light Breaks Through, Understanding Kundalini Experiences Through Psychology, Body and Story. And again, this is an offshoot of your doctoral dissertation. Where can people find your book? I found it on Amazon. Just that way. It's on Amazon. That's where you find it. It's on <laughs> Amazon. Um, if you get the Kindle copy, it's the, there's a lot of, I had uh, my clients go through um, or my research participants, they did drawings and um, uh, yeah. And so that's in color in the Kindle and otherwise it's in um oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the drawings are fascinating. And can't reach wait to read the other people's stories because I only read yours. But again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sherry. It was such a pleasure to be here and really great talking with you. Thanks for listening. I hope this sparked as much curiosity for you as it did for me. There's just so many avenues to explore and rabbit holes to dive down when it comes to this beautiful quickening energy of kundalini, this life force, this feminine life force that merges us with the divine. Uh, I mentioned this in the episode, but I've had to kind of merge my Western Christian understanding with the Eastern wisdom tradition as it relates to Kundalini awakening experiences, just to kind of fit it into my existing paradigms. And knowing that I've probably had different times in my life, especially the Costa Rica experience that I mentioned in the episode, but I feel compelled to see this Kundalini energy quickening as a pure and benevolent force just an act of grace, Um, not evil at all, but just very, very holy. So thank you again for listening. And again, stay tuned for our upcoming changes. Remember that you can find Dana on sacredcorecoaching.com. Have a glorious week and we'll talk to you next time on Women Seeking Wholeness.